All right, here we're beginning a brand new chapter, chapter 11, on sequences and series. So this is probably the biggest chapter of the entire course. And we're going to see that it's really thematically different from the main narrative of calculus that you've seen so far, which is mainly focused on derivatives and integrals and, and how to work those out and how they fit into everything. So yeah, this is going to look and feel very different. And because of that, I actually like to start with kind of an intro to this entire topic by showing you the punchline at the end of everything. So where we're headed and why this chapter and this topic exists at all in calculus is because the functions that we know and love, like e to the x, sine x, cosine x, etc., they can be written as an infinite sum of terms, which is called a series. For instance, e to the x can be written as the infinite sum from 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial, whose terms would be 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial, etc. So this is what e to the x is equal to. And sine of x also has an infinite series. It's called a power series form. It looks like this, and its terms are actually alternating in sine, and they're the odd terms of the, of the exponential series. So this is going to be x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial minus x to the 7 over 7 factorial plus etc. That pattern's going to continue. And cosine of x is actually just the even terms alternating in sine. So that'll be 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial minus x to the 6 over 6 factorial plus etc. Now these are actual equalities. Like literally cosine of x is equal to this infinite series. So now we're going to uncover this in section 11.9, 11.10, kind of right around there. So what chapter 11 is, is basically building up all the vocabulary and kind of the algebra of infinite sequences and series that we need in order to establish and use the facts that we can see right here. Well, now, why do we care about this? Well, if we take a look at e to the x and we decide we want to take the derivative of e to the x, we can take the derivative of each of these terms. Uh, well, what would we get if we did that? Well, the derivative of 1 is 0. The derivative of x is 1. The derivative of x squared is 2x. The derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. The derivative of x to the fourth is 4x cubed, and so on, right? OK, well, this becomes 1 plus. Now, this 2 cancels with the leading factor of the 2 factorial, leaving it just x over 1, which is x. This 3 cancels with the leading factor of 3 factorial, 3 factorial, of course, being 3 times 2 times 1. So the 3s cancel, leaving it as just a 2 factorial. So this is x squared over 2 factorial. The 4 cancels with the leading factor of 4 factorial. 4 factorial is 4, 3, 2, 1. So the 4 canceling gives us just 3, 2, 1, which is 3 factorial. And this pattern, again, would just continue. And what do we get? Well, that's exactly the series representation for e to the x. So we can see that the derivative of e to the x is indeed e to the x. OK, not particularly groundbreaking because we already knew that. But isn't it cool that we can see that in series form? And what that will allow us to do is take, for instance, integrals that are inaccessible to us like this Gaussian integral, which is impossible to work out in terms of elementary functions. However, we could work it out term by term using a power series. 
Uh, let's look at one more really cool thing. The derivative of sine of x would be the derivative of the power series for sine, so that would be x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial minus x to the 7 over 7 factorial plus doo -doo -doo. and derivative of x is 1 minus Again, we're going to get 3x squared, but the 3 will cancel with the leading factor of 3 factorial, so we're going to get x squared over 2 factorial. The derivative of x to the 5 is 5x to the 4th. Same story, that 5 will cancel with the 5 factorial, so we get x to the 4th over what's left is 4 factorial, and x to the 6 over 6 factorial. And Okay, well, that's just the power series that we know for cosine of x. So derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. There's something to this, and that's the whole point of this particular introductory segment here, is there is something to this concept of sequences and series. Like I said, the particular moves that we're playing with right now this is actually late game for sections 11.9, 11.10 kind of era. But in order to get there, we need to build up a lot of notions of what can we and what can we not do with sequences and series, some vocabulary, and we need to talk about when does an infinite sum converge and when does it not. So we're going to go to the very beginning, of course, which is section 11.1 .1 on sequences. Okay, so sequences. So a sequence is just an unending list of numbers called terms. So we can just literally list the terms of a sequence. Uh, this particular sequence started with an index of one, but you could also start with an index of zero. In fact, you can start with any index. Just the point is, is that they go on forever. So the notation is simply you could write the pattern for the nth term, a n, and put that in braces. Or you could also specify the index of the first term and then just write an infinity to indicate that it's going on forever. So very often we don't actually care where a sequence starts and we just assume that it goes on to infinity. So we don't write the n equals 1 to infinity all the time. But occasionally we do care where it starts. Uh, let's see a quick example. So here's the notation for a sequence, the sequence of terms n over n plus 1. So let's write out some of the terms of this sequence. So a1 would simply be obtained by taking the general term n over n plus 1 and replacing n with 1. So we would get 1 over 1 plus 1, which is 1 half. So we'd say the first term of the sequence is 1 half. a2 would be 2 over 2 plus 1, so that's 2 thirds. a3, 3 over 3 plus 1, so that's 3 fourths. And you can do this all day if you want. We often refer to simply to a n, which is the general term, so that's kind of the formula for the thing. So that's a general term. Oftentimes we want the term right after the general term which would be replacing n in the formula with n plus 1. So in this case, that reduces to n plus 1 over n plus 2. Uh, the reason we want that sometimes the n plus 1th term is because we might be wanting to make a claim about the sequence wherein we might say it's decreasing and it decreases forever. And in order to do that, we would need to compare two arbitrary terms. So we would compare, say, a n with the one right after it, a n plus 1. Uh, for that matter, occasionally we need to refer to the term right before a general term. So that would be a sub n minus 1. And that's 
n minus 1 over n minus 1 plus 1, which would be n minus 1 over n. So the terms written out would look something like this. We'd have, say, 1 half, 2 thirds, 3 fourths, doot, 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 the nth term, doot, 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 goes on forever. OK, now most of the time we're working with sequences. We aren't only interested in the specific terms, but we're really interested in the long-term behavior, meaning do the terms approach a specific number? So for instance, if we let n equal 1,000, what does the 1,000th term look like? That's a 1,000. That would be 1,000 over 1,001. So notice that a 1,000 is very, very close to 1, right? And a 1 million would be 1 million over 1 million 1. And that's even closer to 1 than a 1,000. So you might guess, and you'd be correct, that this sequence approaches 1. We could say that the sequence converges, and its limit is equal to 1. And of course, the way we would truly establish that is by taking the limit of a n using everything we know about how to compute limits. And we're going to get to all that. OK, so here we have a sequence. And we are asked to find the first five terms of the sequence. So that's a1, a2, all the way up through a5. Actually, we're not told that it technically starts at a1. This could start at a0, right? This could be kind of an n equals 0 to infinity situation. Uh, so in that situation, you have some license to kind of choose what's appropriate. And I say we start with 1. So a1 is going to be negative 1 to the 1, 1 plus 1 over 3 to the 1. So we're going to see that this is going to come out negative and we get 2 over 3. a2 is negative 1 squared, 2 plus 1 over 3 squared. So negative 1 squared is positive, and the numerator is 3 over 3 squared, 9. So this is reduces to 1 third. a sub 3 is negative 1 cubed, 3 plus 1 over 3 cubed. And negative 1 cubed is, well, we're negative again. So 3 plus 1 is 4 over 27. So notice that negative 1 to the n will either evaluate to plus 1 or negative 1. So this type of sequence is called an alternating sequence, where the sign changes with each term. And it's represented in the general term, usually with a factor that looks like this, negative 1 to the n. So a sub 4 is negative 1 to the 4. We're back to being positive. 4 plus 1 over 3 to the 4. So this is going to be positive 5 over 3 to the 4, which is 81. And a sub 5, negative 1 to the 5. So we'll be negative again. 5 plus 1, 3 to the 5. So we get 6 over 243. Oh, it's negative. And reduces to negative 2 over 81. All right, so a sequence whose sign changes with consecutive terms is called an alternating sequence. So not every sequence has a simple defining equation like we've seen. So let's just quickly acknowledge types of sequences that don't, but can still be well defined. So for example, the sequence p sub n, where pn is the human population at, say, midnight Pacific time on January 1st of the year n. Uh, so this is a well-defined sequence, even if the specific terms, we don't know their exact values. For instance, when n is equal to 2020, 
you know, the term P2020 is whatever exact number of people that existed on January 1st, midnight Pacific time of the year 2020. So it's whatever, I mean, even though we don't exactly know, it's it's some specific number. That's exactly the 2020th term of this sequence. Uh, here's another one. Uh, the sequence AN, where AN is the nth digit of pi. So this sequence we can actually determine even if there's no straightforward formula. 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 9, 2, etc. Right? And that goes on forever. So what is the 10 billionth term of this sequence? Well, it's the 10 billionth digit of pi, right? So whatever that is, it's something. You could guess and probably have a 10% probability of being right. Okay, other sequences are defined recursively. So probably the most well-known recursive sequence is this one, the sequence uh, Fn, where F1 is defined to be 1, and F2 is also defined to be 1, and then the nth F, so Fn, is the sum of the previous two terms. So let's see its first few terms. Uh, well, the first terms are defined to be 1 and 1, and then after that, uh, it's the sum of the previous two terms. So 1 plus 1 is 2, and then 1 plus 2 is 3. 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 plus 5 is 8, and then 13, and then 21, etc. Uh, typically in a face-to-face -face class, I stop and ask if anybody recognizes this particular sequence. It's famous, and usually uh, quite a number of people do recognize it, so this is the Fibonacci sequence. All right, um, I will say that we will restrict most of our attention almost entirely, actually, on uh, sequences where we do have a very well-defined general term because that is the type of sequence that leads us to uncovering the theory of infinite series representations of functions. Okay, so in this next set of examples, we're going to be looking for the formula for the general term. Now, the formula for the general term does depend on how we index the sequence. So all things considered, just assume that we always start at one unless there's a specific reason why we wouldn't. So this is the n equal 1, n equal 2, n equal 3, n equal 4. So our a sub n is going to be something. And it's going to be a formula where when we plug 1 into it, we get 3 fifths. When we plug 2 into it, we get negative 4 over 25, etc. So the way to approach this is just by tokenizing what you have and writing out each token. So for instance, we have an alternating sequence. So let's manage that first. We know that an alternating sequence introduces a factor of negative 1 to some power. Now last time we saw an alternating sequence, that power was negative 1 to the n. However, negative 1 to the n, as it is, is going to produce a negative when n is odd and a positive when n is even which is the opposite of the situation we have here. So if we subtract 1, that will offset this to the way we want it. So now when n is like say 1 or 3 or 5, an odd number, we actually get negative 1 to an even number, which makes positive. Okay, so we've handled the negatives, so we don't even need to worry about it anymore, working out the rest of this general term. We can see, obviously, there's a fraction, so we have a numerator and a denominator to work out. The numerator is 3, 4, 5, 6. In fact, the numerator is always just 2 more than the actual index. So we can just write n plus 2 here. The denominator is 5 raised to the n. And there it is. We're actually done. So now if I asked you what is the 1,000th term, 
we could see, well, it's negative 1 to the 999, which is going to be negative 1, times 1002 divided by 5 to the 1000. So this will be negative 1002 divided by 5 to the 1000, which is whatever the hell that is. Okay, uh, quick note, I always get this question in a face-to-face -face class, so I'll address it right now. Could we have gone negative 1 to the n plus 1 instead of n minus 1? Absolutely. You have every right to do that, and that will be correct as well. I tend to just go with minus 1 in those situations, but plus 1 is perfectly all right. In fact, negative 1 to the n itself is the same thing as negative 1 to the n plus 2 which is negative 1 to the n plus 4. And you can go this way as well. Negative 1 to the n minus 2. Okay, so like negative 1 to, let's just let n be 6. So negative 1 to the 6, which is positive 1, is the same thing as negative 1 to the 8, which is the same thing as negative 1 to the 10, which is etc. Okay, then you have the other family where you're offset by 1. So you have those two that are the same, as we've discussed, but you also have something like this. Okay, so again, when n is equal to 6, you have negative 1 to the 5, which is equal to negative 1 to the 7, etc. And one more note in this regard. Cosine of pi times n evaluates to negative 1 to the n provided that n is an integer. That n being an element of the set of integers is very important here. So for instance when n is 0 we, we get cosine of 0 which is 1 and of course negative 1 to the 0 is 1. When n is equal to 1 we get cosine of pi which is negative 1. Negative 1 to the 1 is negative 1. So this actually holds. If n is not an integer, like say n is equal to 1 half, then you get cosine of pi over 2, which is 0. And that is definitely not the same thing as negative 1 to the 1 half, which is actually i, right, the imaginary number. So 0 is not equal to i. So it breaks down, but if n is an integer, then you have this identity. Okay, here we have a sequence, 5, 8, 11, 14, 17, and we are interested in the formula for the general term, a n. So again, this is a great example of one where our brains can answer this question without knowing what it's doing. For instance, I think most people could look at this and determine that the next term is 20 without really having to think very hard about it, followed by 23, etc. And why is that? Because we're adding 3, right? Every term is 3 more than the term before it. So, um, great, while well, we've unlocked all its secrets, that doesn't mean that out of the blue, if I ask you for what's the 100th term, well, it would be impractical to just count your way out to the, to the 100th term by adding 3 a bunch of times. So it'd be nice if we had a formula. Well, what are we going to do? First of all, let's decree that the first guy is n equals 1, n equals 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. So those are the indices of this particular sequence. Now the fact that we notice that we're adding 3 is key here to finding the formula. It means that the formula is going to basically be 3 times n and we just have to plus or minus something in order to produce the right first term. So since the first term is 5, we're going to get 3 times 1 which is 3 and well we better add 2 in order to create 5. So 3n plus 2. Actually, that's it. There's our formula. So let's see if it really works. We'll spot check. When we plug 5 in, do we get 17? 3 times 5 is 15, plus 2 is 17. Indeed. So there's our general term. So again, if somebody said, well, what's the 100th term? Well, now you can just see it's 300 and 2. 300 plus 2. Okay, so once again, we are given a sequence 
and asked to find the formula for the general term an. So first thing we ought to notice is that this is an alternating sequence. So let's just get that out of the way. We know there'll be a negative one factor raised to something. Uh, let's identify the indices. That's n equal one, two, three, four, five, etc. So what we want is this is either going to be n or n minus one. And we want it so that when n is equal to one, this comes out to a positive one. So we're going to have to subtract one. All right. So now we can see that the general structure is one divided by something. And you can see that at least it's more evident in the last three terms that we've written down here that what we're doing is we're multiplying each denominator by four as we go down the line. So that means that our denominator is going to be four to some kind of a power, four to the n, say, or four to the n plus five or something. So all we have to do is choose that power so that when the correct index is put in, we get the correct associated term. So let's put the indices back in. Okay, uh, it's probably easiest just to see like the n equals three case. So when we plug three into this exponent, we're gonna want the exponent to come out to be one. So that means that this should be n minus two. So let's see. When n is equal to 3, we're going to get 4 to the 3 minus 2, which is 4 to the 1, which is 4 down there. Ah, good. Let's spot check the case here. When n is equal to 5, we're going to get 4 to the 5 minus 2, which is 4 cubed, which is 64. So, yay, we win. So, again, now we could ask what is the, say, 50th term. And that's going to be negative 1 to the 49, which is odd, so that's just going to be negative, uh, 1 over 4 raised to the 48, 50 minus 2. So there we are. Okay, now what we're really after in this section is discussing the long-term behavior of sequences, in particular, whether they converge or diverge and if they do converge, what that limit is. So what do convergence and divergence even mean here? Well, let's define them. So we say a sequence converges to a limit L if the limit evaluated on the general term exists and equals L. So simple as that. Uh, if the limit does not exist or evaluates to plus or minus infinity, then we say the sequence diverges. All right, so here we have to not only find the general term, as we've been doing in the last few examples, but also determine whether the sequence converges, and if so, find its limit. Now, let me talk a little bit about this wording here because this is exactly the wording that's used in your textbook. And in fact, in my experience, most textbooks have some version of this wording almost exactly like this. So this may seem like an odd way of asking the question because the way that we determine whether a sequence converges is by evaluating the limit. So it's sort of weird that it's like, okay, if you decide that the sequence converges, then find its limit, well, you've found its limit, right? So um, the reason why it's asking this way is simply because there are other ways of establishing whether or not a sequence converges or diverges. And we aren't actually going to be exploring those other ways, but there are other ways. And so this is technically the right way to ask the question. First, see if the sequence converges. If so, find its limit. So what we're going to be doing is just simply evaluating the limit and presenting it uh, if we have convergence. So, of course, the first thing we need is the general term, and we can probably get that pretty easily just by looking at this thing. So the general term here is going to be a sub n, which appears to be radical n divided by e to the n. Okay, so that's good. Uh, now we'll put our attention on the convergence part of this problem. So we're simply going to evaluate the limit as n approaches infinity of a n. 
So that's the limit as n approaches infinity of radical n over e to the n. Okay, so yeah, suddenly we're in math 3a evaluating limits. So we can see that if we let n approach infinity in this form, we're going to get infinity in the numerator and infinity in the denominator. And I hope you recall what to do in this situation, which is to apply L'Hopital's rule. The problem is we are not allowed to do that. L'Hopital's rule requires that the numerator and the denominator be differentiable functions. And you may be saying, yeah, but square root and exponentiation, those are differentiable functions. They are differentiable on a continuum, like the real numbers, but they are not differentiable on a discrete set of numbers, like the set of integers, which is how a sequence is defined on the set of integers. So this may seem like a very sticky point, but we are not allowed to use L'Hopital's rule on the terms of a sequence because they're not differentiable. They're just a bunch of dots. You're kidding me, right? So, okay, but yeah, who cares, right? I mean, we, we know that we could just take the derivative and be done, uh, but we can't do that. So we are forced to conform to the rigorous laws of mathematics, and that means that we need to do what's called an interpolating function. So what we're going to do is we're going to let f of x equal radical x over e to the x, and we're going to assume that's defined on the real numbers. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x. And this is all done as side work. So, okay, this gives the indeterminate form infinity over infinity, but since this is a differentiable function defined on the continuum of the real numbers, we can take L'Hopital's rule. So I usually just put a little h next to that equal sign. We'll go limit as x approaches infinity, and L'Hopital's rule, if you recall, hopefully, involves replacing the numerator with its derivative and simultaneously replacing the denominator with its derivative. So we're going to get 1 over 2 rad x in the numerator and e to the x in the denominator. Cleaning this up, we get this form. And now we're going to get 1 over some quantity that clearly approaches infinity. So that form means the limit evaluates to 0. We can therefore conclude that the limit of the sequence, so we're done our side work, going back to the limit of the sequence, that equals zero. So what's our conclusion? Our conclusion is that the sequence converges. and its limit is zero. So that means the terms of this particular sequence approach zero. Now, an important habit to pick up in this chapter is clearly articulating your thought process. So in particular, I institute a ban on pronouns. So in other words, it's not acceptable just to say, converges. Oh, I mean, that doesn't have any pronouns, but that's not even a sentence. And it's not acceptable to say it converges, which is a sentence, but that's a pronoun. What is it that's converging? Well, if you truly understand, then there's really no sweat in actually just writing out the sequence. The sequence converges. There it is. Or you could even say, the sequence converges. That's good. You're being clear. Okay. In later problems throughout this chapter, we're going to have multiple sequences and series that we're dealing with at once, so it's not going to be enough just to say it converges or even converges. It's not clear. So simply just say what the thing is that's converging or diverging. Okay, I will be looking for that. The sequence is converging. The limit is zero. 
Uh, probably the most compact way to say this would be the sequence converges to zero. That's good. Okay, before moving on with a few more examples, let's write down the let's write down some limit theorems that we're going to be using, including the one we just saw. So we'll start with the one we just saw, which is this fact right here. So a theorem, of course, just means an established fact in mathematics. So we saw that if the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x is equal to some l value, and if f of n agrees with the nth term of a sequence, where n is an integer, then we can conclude that the limit as n approaches infinity of the terms of the sequence evaluate to L. Okay, so here f of x is often just our related differentiable function. And it's just a hack so that we can use L'Hopital's rule to evaluate the harder limits. Okay, so next thing we're going to see is the following fact. If the limit of the absolute value of a sequence's terms evaluates to zero, then the limit of the original sequence evaluates to zero. Okay. This is a particularly useful theorem for establishing whether or not an alternating sequence is convergent or divergent. So we'll use that whenever we have an alternating sequence. Okay, and finally, one more theorem, which is going to be a huge time saver. And that's simply evaluating the limit of an algebraic expression. So we'll call it P sub n, Q sub n, where Pn and Qn are purely algebraic. So what does that mean? They're polynomials and possibly may include square roots and other radicals, but no natural logs, no exponentials, no trigonometry. So what does the theorem actually say? Well, it says that the limit as n approaches infinity of pn over qn is equal to one of three possible outcomes. And it depends on the relative degrees of the numerator and the denominator's polynomial form. So we're going to say that this evaluates to 0 if the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator. This evaluates to plus or minus infinity if the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator. And finally, in the case where the degrees match, then this is going to evaluate to a fraction, a over b, where a and b are the leading coefficients. Okay, so let's see an example of using this fact immediately. So let's say we have, say, I don't know, radical n cubed minus 6, all divided by radical 5 plus 2 n to the fourth. Okay, well, if you're not paying attention, then you'll just sort of try to plug infinity in, and you'll find that this is infinity over infinity. And, and then you might think, well, okay, let's build an f of x and use L'Hopital's rule. And yes, all of that's going to work, but L'Hopital's rule involves taking some derivatives. This is not going to be fun to work with. So, okay, well, no problem, because you also have an algebraic way of working this out by dividing everything by the highest power of n, which is the square root of n to the fourth. So that would be like 1 over n squared, 1 over n squared, and distributing and so on. And you'll actually get the right answer doing that too. But since this is purely algebraic, we can just go straight to the answer without showing any intermediate work. And this is a huge time saver by comparing the degrees. So in particular, this degree here is three halves, don't forget that square root, and this degree here is four halves. So since the degree of the denominator is bigger than the degree of the numerator, this evaluates to zero, just like that.
done. Uh, so what if instead of this being 2n to the fourth, what if it were 2n cubed? Now we have matching degrees. And in that case, it's going to be the leading coefficient of the numerator. So that's the coefficient of the of the n cubed term. So that's the square root of 1, which is 1, divided by the leading coefficient of the denominator, which would be the square root of 2. So this limit evaluates to 1 over root 2. OK. Um, and if the denominator had a smaller degree, like this, then again, we don't really have to do much thinking. We have a higher degree in the numerator than the denominator. So this is going to approach plus or minus infinity. And that just depends on the arrangement of specific pluses and minuses. But both terms here will always produce a positive. So this is positive infinity. OK, so the remainder of this lecture will be just going through examples that look like this. Uh, we're going to determine whether or not a sequence converges or diverges. And in the case where the sequence converges, we will find the limit. So OK, for an alternating sequence, we're going to evaluate the limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of the terms. So here we have limit as n approaches infinity of absolute value of a n is the limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of this thing. So the absolute value essentially annihilates that alternating factor. And n itself is always positive. So this is really just this limit right here, which evaluates to 0. And that theorem says that if the limit of the absolute value of a term approaches 0, we get to conclude that the limit of the actual terms themselves approach 0. So therefore, this sequence converges. And its limit is 0. Uh, the only way uh, an alternating sequence can converge is if the limit does equal 0, because if the limit evaluated to, say, 5, um, that means the terms are getting close to 5. But if they're alternating, that means that well, like one term ago, you were at negative 5. And one term from now, you're going to be back at negative 5. So you're just kind of bouncing back and forth between positive 5 and negative 5, which would not be convergence. So the only way this works is if they kind of all meet in the middle at 0, right? which is what this whole process with the absolute values is checking. All right, this is not an alternating sequence. So we're just going to evaluate the limit straightforwardly to see if the sequence converges. So the limit as n approaches infinity of a n is the limit as n approaches infinity of 2n plus 1 factorial over 2n minus 1 factorial. And we are seeing our first of what will be many, many factorial battles. That's where you have a factorial in a numerator and a factorial in a denominator. And the way that you resolve a factorial battle is by unwrapping the larger factorial until you get to the smaller factorial. So. What I mean by that is if you say you have 9 factorial divided by 6 factorial, this will always reduce because you can take the larger factorial, which is 9, and write it as 9 times 8 times 7 times, and then 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, that's just 6 factorial. And then here's our 6 factorial, and you can kind of cancel, and you get 9, 8, 7. So you do that evaluation. So we're going to do that here. So we'll take the larger one which is the numerator, and we'll start to unwrap it. So the leading factor is 2n plus 1. But now we're going to subtract 1 from that to get the next factor, which is 2n. And we're going to subtract 1 from that to get 2n minus 1. And oh, that's the same as the bottom. So let's just stop and write our factorials. And we can cancel those. So this is really 
this limit right here, which you don't even need to bother foiling that. You're going to get infinity very clearly as n approaches infinity. And that means that this sequence is divergent. Okay, so yes, here we have another sequence and same imperative. We are going to determine whether or not the sequence converges. If it converges, we will write down its limit. So in order to do that, we will evaluate the limit as n approaches infinity of a n. So, okay, so this limit is limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus s over n to the n. All right, so what's the form that we get? Well, the base of this exponent uh, is 1 plus s over n as n approaches infinity. So the whole base is 1, and the n in the exponent approaches infinity. So it's kind of the form 1 to the infinity. Okay, well, you encountered this as well multiple times in Calc 1, evaluating limits. The most common way to get this wrong is just to think, well, 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 times 1, that must be 1, and this is 1, so we're done. This is definitely not 1. This is an indeterminate form. So we're going to need L'Hopital's rule to evaluate this indeterminate form. And since we know we're going to use L'Hopital's rule, we're going to have to get that related differentiable function, the interpolation. So we will let f of x equal 1 plus s over x to the x. And we will evaluate the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x and put all our attention on doing that. And whatever that result is, we'll map over to the limit of the original sequence and we'll be able to draw our conclusion at that point. The limit as x approaches infinity of f of x is the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 plus s over x to the x. Of course, this still approaches 1 to the infinity, so we still have the same problem, but at least now we're dealing with differentiable form. So, okay, to use L'Hopital's rule, we need to have this in a fractional form. We need to have the indeterminate form 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity, and we're not even close to that. So you may recall from Calc 1 that in this particular situation, we would let y equal this form. So writing it this way allows us to take the ln of both sides. And now we can bring the exponent down, and we've kind of solved the problem of having an exponential indeterminate form. So if we take the limit of both sides, we can see this form is now going to be infinity times, and then the ln of 1, which is 0. So we have infinity times 0. Still indeterminate, still not ready to use L'Hopital's rule, but we're closer. Because once you've got this form of infinity times 0, it's just a matter of sending one of the factors to the denominator, so you'll have the form for L'Hopital's rule. So this is going to be ln of 1 plus s over x divided by 1 over x. So instead of multiplying by x, we're dividing by 1 over x. And now we're going to get the form 0 divided by 0. Wonderful. We are ready officially to use L'Hopital's rule on this. So we'll put a little h here indicating that we're using L'Hopital's rule. And we're going to get the derivative of the numerator. So ln of stuff, its derivative is 1 over the stuff, multiplied by the derivative of the stuff. So that would be s times the derivative of 1 over x, which is negative 1 over x squared. And in the denominator, derivative of 1 over x is negative 1 over x squared. Well, we certainly have our work cut out for us in terms of cleaning this up. Although those two factors immediately cancel, which is nice. 
So what we get is s over 1 plus s over x. Remember, the left side the whole time was the limit as x approaches infinity of ln of y. All right, well, now we can actually evaluate the limit. What do we get? On the right-hand side, we just get s. Okay, but remember, what are we after? We're after the limit as x approaches infinity of y. So let's just push the limit inside the natural log, which we can do because natural log is a continuous function. And let's just e both sides. So we have limit as x approaches infinity of y is equal to e to the s. So our conclusion is that the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 plus s over x to the x is equal to e to the s. Okay, so it is not equal to 1. It's e to the s. In fact, in the special case where s is equal to 1, this is a well-known fact, and sometimes taken as the definition of e. All right, but remember the context we're working in. We actually were looking for this limit. Ah, of course, well, that's also e to the s by one of our theorems. And so that's a finite number. So we can conclude that the sequence a n converges. And the limit is e to the s. So we can say nice and compactly that the sequence converges to e to the s. As you may recall from Calc 1, that's about as troublesome as L'Hopital's rule can be. You do need to know that process because it's going to come up several times uh, throughout your work this, in this chapter. However, if you encounter this limit at all for any s value, you can jump straight to this form, e to the s. Okay? This is a very well-known limit that we've just proved a single time and then you have the free right to just jump straight to the answer next time you see that limit.